Hello, uh, welcome back. My name is Karina Urbach. I'm the convener of this lecture series and the historian of modern Europe. The country is divided, families are divided, the press seems to be biased, there is no tolerance anymore, people are not listening to each other anymore. I'm not talking about the United States, I'm talking about the United Kingdom. <laughs> It has become the theater of the absurd. Um, the last time we checked, um, Theresa May offered to um, resign if the, um, her deal goes through, and the headline was very funny. Uh, it said, back her to sack her. And um, that was a quite a tempting offer, I thought. But um, we, we, we really don't know what is going to happen in the next two days. and. Um, there is hope, however, because we have a great expert here tonight, and she is going to put all this into context. She's going to explain to us how we got into the mess, and um, I hope in the discussion we might find out um, how we get out of it. I don't know. It's too optimistic. Okay. So. Um, Professor Patricia Clevin is, of course, um, a former member of the IAS, and um, that's not her only credentials. She has um, been a, a fellow of the British Academy. She is a fellow of the British Academy. She um, is also an advisor to the Foreign Office, and that's why she really can give us um, insights into what is happening here. And she has been awarded the uh, British Academic Medal for her latest book. She has written many books, but her latest book was Securing the World Economy, the Reinvention Reinve of the League of Nations. Please welcome Patricia Clevin. Good evening, or good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted and honoured to be back here at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, to speak on the history of Britain's relations with Europe. And I must thank Karina Urbach uh, as the curator of the lecture series, uh, Meredith Lortzer for taking such care of the practical arrangements, and of course the director, the trustees, the members and visitors uh, of the Institute for making me feel so welcome this evening or this afternoon. I'm a bit unsure about the time, never mind all the other things that... Karina's promise that I can uh, enlighten you on. On the 23rd of June 2016, just over 72% of the British electorate voted in a referendum that asked, should the United Kingdom remain a member of or leave the European Union? Just under 52% voted in favour of leaving. And the map here shows you a spatial distribution of uh, leave by majority. The, the colours are a bit arbitrary. The, the map itself has gone through various versions, but the leave is in blue and the remain is in yellow. I suppose the stars of the European Union are, are why it's yellow and then the blue is for the other side. Um, and, uh, and I've outlined just the kind of basic steps, uh, uh, features of that referendum. The consequences of that outcome, Brexit, so Britain's exit from the European Union, haven't just defined Britain's relations with the European Union for the past two and three quarter years, it feels interminable, I have to say, but have consumed the political life of the United Kingdom and its constituent parts, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And of course, in these discussions, the union with Northern Ireland has received a lot of attention. There's also, of course, the union under a sanctified, under an act of union with Scotland that's also part of that deal alongside Britain's, England's relations with Wales. It was the Conservative Party, which currently leads the British government, that in 1973 took Britain into the European economic community. Neither of the two major political parties, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, have ever been entirely united on their approaches towards European integration. And European integration itself is an evolving project, and that's also part of the challenge here, is coping with the fact that Britain is changing, and also the European Union, or European Economic Community, and then Union, changes over time. But since 1992, in particular, with the creation of the European Union, so the shift from the European Economic Community 
to the European Union, the issue of membership has riven the Conservative Party in particular. Since the 2016 vote, political commentators and political scientists have spent a great deal of energy trying to unpack the immediate swirl of issues that led to the June referendum. British politics harboured divisions that were certainly underestimated uh, and the referendum exposed them, but there were some warning signs. These swirl of issues might be encapsulated as a sense of alienation felt by some over the broad consensus that him, had emerged in the, across the major political parties in the, from the 90s onwards around major issues. Uh, and th those feeling, feeling alienated would identify their alienation around issues to do with the economy or also to do with value issues, so identity politics, uh, sexual politics. Um, there was also, uh, this was combined with a lack of an outlet for their concerns in mainstream British politics. There was nowhere for this alienation to go, either towards the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, certainly not the Liberal Democrats. Social and economic inequalities were also increasing as the political landscape was becoming more volatile. When choosing how to vote in the referendum campaign, established sources of guidance, political parties, experts, trade unions, business groups simply no longer had the kind of authoritative standing that they had enjoyed when Britain joined the European Economic Community in 1973 and had a referendum to confirm that decision in 1975. Meanwhile, divisions within the European Union were at the same time becoming more, or well, they were actually more public than the divisions within Britain at that point. The 2008 credit crunch and the subsequent Eurozone crisis appeared to pitch Northern Europe against Southern Europe, while member states to the east of Europe had different views from those to the west on how to address the Syrian refugee crisis. So Europe was basically split north and south, east and west, depending on the issues. And what we know about referenda, well, this is what political scientists tell us, is that in general, people tend to vote for the safe option. That's what they did in some respects in 1975, after Britain had been in the European Economic Community for two years. What's interesting about 2016 is in some ways, the referendum made a choice for change because change actually seemed the less risky option for the majority of people who voted for that change, the 52% over the 48%. None of these immediate issues, however, illuminate the specifics of Europe's relations with Europe. Britain's relations with Europe, sorry. Okay, sure, yeah, I'm wearing another one, but if that's not working, yeah. Can everybody at the back, can you hear me too? No? Okay, thank you. Um, so none of these immediate issues, however, illuminate the specifics of Britain's relations with Europe. Their historical and practical workings received very little attention in the 2016 referendum campaign. A better appreciation of this history would have offered a guide to the magnitude of the challenges at hand that we're still, still wrestling with. And I would argue some credible ways of imagining the future of Britain's relations with Europe. In this lecture, I have tried not to let the end of the story overly determine what goes before it. It's a great thing of historians. We have the end of the story and then we try and work out how do we get from here to there. I've tried not to let the end overly determine the story because what Brexit means for Britain and Britain's relations with Europe still, still remains unclear. The one thing it is not is an end to that history. Brexit only means the beginning of a process of renegotiation. Brexit is a departure, not a destination. Before 2016, histories of Britain's relations with the European Union were often framed as the story of star-crossed lovers. Since the divorce was announced in 2016, its history has played out as an, an, Ill, an end to an ill-fated marriage whose courtship began in the less than auspicious circumstances of the Second World War. 
often focused on social and cultural questions that emphasise a disenchantment with politics itself, and I would say that is a pronounced feature of Brexit, a disenchantment with politics itself. These backstories tell us more about domestic relationships within Britain than about Britain's relations with Europe and international organisations. So, looking at the past to understand our present, which is the purpose of this lecture series, my starting point won't be any of these. 1951, 1956, 1973, 1992 or 2016. You can see the significance of each of these years on the right-hand side, your left, on the screen behind me. Those are the kind of classic markers of Britain's, of, of the emergence of the European Economic Community and the emergence of the European Union and Britain's relationship with those institutions. Instead, my lecture starts with what Institute faculty member George Cannon characterised in 1979 as the great seminal catastrophe of the 20th century, World War I. In the German language, Cannon's portrayal of that event is translated as die Urkatastrophe. The prefix Ur carries with it connotations of original or primal. In this lecture, I argue that during and after the First World War, Britain led the way in establishing pathways of institution building in Britain's relations with Europe that generated ideas and practices that over time would bring about or help to bring about union in Europe. This process is normally associated with the years after 1945 and not with Britain. So this is a summary of where I'm going to go. <laughs> this lecture will illustrate, too, a deep continuity in British foreign policy, how Britain equated its national security with the security of the world. In the 1920s, Britain's strong focus on the need to foster cooperation with Europe complemented this global vision. But in the 1930s, European concerns were secondary to Britain's preoccupation with its empire, and in the 1940s, the imperative of Anglo-American cooperation. The lecture reveals how these trends and World War II cut across Britain's relations with Europe. Although after 1945, Britain associated its conventional security with the security of Europe, it thought about its economic stability and prosperity in national and global imperial terms. Over time, the empire sort of falls away. The global part still stays there. Well, it falls away in the British imagination. It doesn't necessarily fall away in anybody else's. This lecture concludes by showing that Britain only began to consider joining the European Economic Community, the EEC, in the 1960s as its political economy faltered and empire came to an end. These associations of decline contrasted with Britain's victory in democracy's name in 1945. And these two things, associating the EEC or the European Union with decline and the importance of democracy and Britain battling for it in 1945, bookend a historical narrative that was mobilised by the Vote Leave movement in the 2016 referendum. Leaving the, the European Union would be the moment when a newly confident global Britain would take back control, as a key slogan, take back control from the tyranny of unelected bureaucrats. How the process of disengagement would work and what control meant received much less attention. Let me offer a metaphor for the tension between ideas and their application through two fictional characters who are regarded by the rest of the world and even by the British as quintessentially British. And the, the, this book, the slogan for this book is partly where the title of this lecture comes from. Bertram Bertie, Wilberforce Wooster, and his valet, Jeeves. These two characters first appear in print in 1915, but they're quintessentially associated, typically associated, with the era of the two world wars. Jeeves and Wooster 
serve, I can't help saying Wooster because it's always the way that the enemies Wooster, um, you know, anyone that's frustrated with them says Wooster, um, serve as a means to illustrate the dynamics of pragmatism and idealism. Jeeves the pragmatist, Wooster the dreamy idealist. This paper leans towards Jeeves, so it focuses on the practice of British diplomacy as much as the ideas behind it. It's important for me to draw out this distinction because the history of international cooperation is almost always placed in the realm of ideas. This is true whether it's international cooperation um, relating to collective security, international disarmament, free trade, um, or the development of regional or international organizations. It tends less to be about practice and more about mobilizing ideas. And here it's also worth noting that the European Union is an outlier as an international organization because of its preference for institutionalized governance. What that means is something I'll come back to. 100 years ago this week, there's a lot of anniversaries around us all over the place. 100 years ago this week, this one relates to here, the peacemakers in Paris agreed the covenant of the League of Nations, the world's first international organization. This groundbreaking body multilateralized international relations at a stroke. And that's what's very significant to the history of the European Economic Community, multilateralism too. This signaled a break with the 19th century notion that the European continent could be pacified by a balance of power that would prevent <coughs> military domination by a single power or a group of powers. After 1919, there was an attempt to establish procedural rules on which stable and legitimate cooperation would depend. Like the European Economic Community, founded after the Treaty of Rome 40 years later, the League of Nations underlined how conflict had economic aspects. It's one of the things that's really surfaced in the debate around the Irish backstop for anybody following it, is actually the European Union has quite a strong sense of itself as a peace project. So this is also one of the echoes um, that I'm trying to draw back to the history of the League of Nations, which of course connects to Princeton in lots of different ways. World War I had turned the world economy into a potential weapon. After September 1914, national frontiers were strongly expressed in militarized terms, and states developed ever more sophisticated practices to control the movement of people and goods. Britain led this transformation. So Britain thinks of itself as free trading, but Britain led this transformation in 1914. And it did so by orchestrating the Allied blockade of Germany and Austria-Hungary. The blockade was a wholesale intervention into the practice of international trade with lasting effects. It compromised a series of political, administrative and naval manoeuvres managed and guided by the British Foreign Office to convince allied and neutral countries to stop trading with Britain's enemy in Europe. The legal steps taken to facilitate the blockade marked the effective abandonment of laissez-faire policies that had been the foundation of British trade with Europe and with the empire for most of the 19th century. Conservative Prime Minister Robert Peel's unilateral decision in 1846 to repeal the Corn Laws, which for 30 years had imposed um, protection on food and grain, or tariffs on food and grain in Britain, was especially influential. And that repeal of the Corn Laws is an iconic moment in the, in which, in the history of free trade that shapes also the imagined Britain of many of the Leave campaigners. This is what they see Britain as a free trading nation, and that's what they want Britain to be in the move to a global Britain once it's Britain has exited from the European Union. The politics of trade in, the, in World War I captured the forensic eye of another um, Institute of Advanced Study alumnus, Albert O. Hirschman. His seminal 1945 text, National Power and the Structure of Foreign Trade, is primarily recognized for its analysis of how German national socialists used commercial relations for geopolitical ends. What's over, often overlooked with that text is that Hirschman actually takes the Allied blockade 
as the starting point for his analysis. So he really sees the First World War and the Britain's actions in that blockade, which of course it, it attempts to repeat in the Second World War, as the point at which international trade becomes politicised and, and, and a point from which the world won't really recover, and it doesn't really recover from that moment. Many of the protections that are introduced in the First World War are still around in the 1970s and the 1980s. It takes a long, long time to roll back protection. Britain's ability to maintain the blockade demonstrated British economic strength, which was still considerable, bureaucratic resources and maritime power. But the war also fed into changes already underway in both the British economy and Britain's standing in the world that would have important consequences for Britain's external relations. The financial cost of the war meant that Britain was no longer the world's preeminent power, that was now the United States. Whilst in the 1920s, Britain remained the world's preeminent, the biggest preeminent exporting economy, the United States trade was still predominantly internal actually, it faced new competitors in the Americas and Asia, and certainly new ways of working that were much more productive. That was where the United States was really leading the world in ways that terrified Britain and Europe. Britain was put on notice. At the same time, on an international level, the operations of the Allied blockade marked a graduated departure from traditional state-to-state -state diplomacy to include administrative arrangements. So this is the beginning of a long genealogy of bureaucracy, international bureaucracy, that takes us to the European economic community and some of the deeper roots of where Britain's reaction uh, in the last three or so years comes from. The First World War saw a great flowering of inter-allied committees, and they're all listed here. So things like the French, Anglo-French Paris Economic Pact, lots of Anglo-French cooperation, the Wheat Executive, the Allied Maritime and Transport Council, that's the point at which also later the United States joins, along with the Supreme War Council, and the Supreme Economic Council. You don't have to worry too much about those unless you're a committee junkie like me. But what you see is the emergence of lots of coordinated cooperation that's bureaucratic during the course of the First World War. When it comes to understanding the origins and the workings of today's international organisations, including the European Union, the operations of the Allied, Transport, Allied Maritime Transport Council, the AMTC, so the one that's two-thirds from the bottom there, are especially worthy of a closer look. Notionally, national ministers, so government ministers, were in charge of, of shipping during the First World War, which was a vital way of, of keeping the Allied war effort alive. In reality, an executive, so a bunch of bureaucrats, bureaucrats based in London, ran it. The British bureaucrats were in the predominant position. There, a Briton, Arthur Salter, worked closely with Frenchman Jean Monnet, the founding father of the European Union. The two men, Salter and Monet, thereafter lifelong friends, commanded the AMTC Secretariat. And the Secretariat itself organized another 22 inter-allied committees. And the officials working for those committees were expected to divest themselves of any national point of view. So you became a dedicated international civil servant if you worked for this organization. It's the first time that that happens. Whilst the AMTC remained a body of intergovernmental debate and negotiation, its direct links to national governments through these civil servants meant it was much easier to exchange information and implement a decision once it was reached. It was absolutely vital to the efforts to win and the success in winning the First World War on the part of the Allies. In short, the AMTC melded, it brought together national and international levels of decision making, as well as advisory and executive bodies. This wartime experience had profound implications for international thought and practice afterwards. In 1921, Arthur Salter published an influential monograph entitled Allied Shipping Control. It sounds fascinating, doesn't it? 
It set out an argument for intergovernmental cooperation that proved foundational for the new discipline of international relations that was established after the First World War. So there's lots of new things bubbling along 100 years ago, round about now. What was novel at the time was sold to stress on the self-evident need for international administration to deal with complex problems facing the modern world. In his words, above all, oops, going too far, I'm missing a slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide. Um, above all, the Allied experience of organisation solved the problem of controlling action without displacing the authority of national governments. So for the first time you had a body that brought national governments and international civil servants to deal with complex problems in the modern world. And that's a kind of core idea that drives the development of international organisations and regional organisations, of which there are many more subsequently. Theorists have scoured Salter's work to see if Salter makes a case for subsidiarity, which is a defining feature of the European Economic Community and its successor organisation, the European Union. Subsidiarity is also sometimes called supranationality, which means cooperating above states. But Monet never really liked that term because it sort of suggested there was something operating above nation states. He preferred subsidiarity because it suggested the cooperation was happening below nation states. But the nature of the cooperation is still the same. Let me explain what that is. By the principle of subsidiarity, member states cede authority to the European Commission. This doesn't happen in the interwar period. It happens after 1945. It gives the Commission powers of proposal and negotiation in specific fields of legislation. So that's why it was that the European Union was conducting negotiations with the British government as part of the Brexit procedure. They were doing that because they had the authority handed to them by the other member states of the European, or by all the member states of the European Union, but all of the member states of the European Union agree on any deal that the European Union Commission signs on their behalf. In the 1920s, neither practice nor theory of international cooperation and coordination had traveled that far, although Salter was an important influence on David Mitrani. He was the father of functionalism, the political theory which sets out some of the ideas underpinning the operation of subsidiarity. And of course, for those of you familiar with the Institute of Advanced Studies History, David Mitrani was also the first professor of politics and economics appointed here at the Institute. Political scientists stressed the intellectual connections between Salter, Monet and Mitrani and locate the genesis of Mitrani's ideas in the intellectual history of the 1920s. But here too, what happened on the ground, so we're back in the world of Jeeves, was equally influential. In 1919, Romanian-born Mitrani was an important source of intelligence and guidance on the events that were happening in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's what these two pictures relate to. World War I might have ended, but the region was hit by a groundswell of political violence and economic turbulence that many historians currently regard as a European civil war. There's been quite a lot of new work coming out on quite how violent uh, and disruptive this period was in Central European history that saw some estimates stand at about 4 million people losing their lives between 19... 18 and, two, and 1923, 1924, so after, notionally after the war had ended. There was no hegemonic power, there was no single power that could dictate the rules of operation that could stabilise the world in 1919. At first, Britain anticipated the creation of a universal League of Nations would provide the framework for Atlanticism. The British government intended the use Used to use the League as a way of sustaining cooperation with the United States, akin to the sort of operation of the committees I showed you on the previous slide. But, another hundred years ago, the United States' failure to ratify the Paris Peace Treaties and with it the body of law that was subsequently incorporated into the Covenant of the League of Nations meant the League of Nations became a predominantly European institution. 
the organization may have embodied universal ideas and claims, but the European states and concerns, European states and concerns dominated the organizations. Langu its languages were French and English. Its bureaucracy was set up by Britons and Frenchmen. And Salter and Monet were both appointed assistant secretary generals of the new organization. In practice, the Libes global reach came from the fact that most nation states were, or wanted to be, empires, and the League aspired to better imperial governance. It did not, as nationalists in the global south had hoped, signal the end of empire. So here we just have a pictogram of all the different elements that comprise the work of the League of Nations, some of which evolved over time. After 1919, Britain intended the League of Nations to serve as a hub to manage its multilateral relations with, the, with Europe and with the empire. Both were priorities, Europe and empire, when it came to Britain's national defence. It's worth pausing here to reflect on, for a moment, on a usually unquestioned assumption that Britain at some point in the 20th century would, had to make a choice had to make a choice between Europe or the empire. A core proposition for me and of this lecture is that Britain didn't want to pick between the empire and Europe before 1940. And it didn't choose empire over Europe or Europe over empire afterwards. These policy options became irresistible outcomes of the pressures on the domestic economy and the changing character of the world order. As I will show in the 1920s, few Britons presumed there was a preference inside Europe or out. The dilemma opting for, Euro for empire or Europe was a question that emerged for Britain in the difficult economic and geopolitical context of the 1930s. Then empire was the priority. But the history of Britain's appeasement of Japan, Germany and Italy revealed that protecting empire was predicated on stability in Europe. Britain could afford to be global in its orientation if Europe was stable. When the strategy of appeasing the Axis powers failed and these states threatened the security of Britain, it had to wage a second world war within a generation of the first to protect the British Isles and the far-flung empire. The dilemma of Britain's conventional security on the European continent was resolved with the creation of NATO in 1949. Britain's commitment to Western European conventional security was, and for now, remains clear. But after 1945, selecting empire or Europe became real alternatives faced by the British government as the result of Britain's impoverished economic circumstances and moves to create new institutions to unlock Western European protectionism and promote cooperation in Western Europe. In the 1940s and 50s, Britain opted for empire, pivoting towards the EEC in the 1960s and 70s. It's striking how these arguments were rehearsed again by the Leave campaign in the referendum. Images of the glories of 19th century free trading Britain and its Commonwealth ties were resuscitated in a fantasy, set of fantasies around a new global Britain for a life without the European Union. Indeed, a life without Europe. That's one of the things that's become very blurry. What's the European Union? What's Europe? There were no references in the, in, the 19, in the 2016 referendum to the catastrophic failures of British foreign policy in the 1930s when Britain made precisely such a choice without the luxury of an American commitment to European security. So one of the reasons that Britain feels it can make that choice is because it's, it's confident that the United States stands behind NATO and NATO stands behind European security. In 1919, the USA's departure from Europe meant that Britain was the main provider of European security. The League of Nations, which formally opened its doors in Geneva in 1920, was the means through which the British government sought to manage its relations with France and Germany, once Germany joined in 1925. And the important treaties followed for mutual assistance with France in 1923, which was the basis on which Britain went to France's aid in 1939, and the Geneva Protocol that outlawed chemical and biological weapons. This was no heady idealism. If many of the steps 
Notably, Britain's efforts to promote European disarmament were ultimately unsuccessful. Plenty of diplomacy is. They established norms intended to institutionalize practical measures to affect European security. These policies were intended at the same time to pace key British political figures in Geneva, Austin Chamberlain, Anthony Eden, Robert Cecil, at the heart of domestic politics too. So this is a period where being a, an important international player, showing international leadership, also brought you big brownie points, significant political collateral at home. As I've already suggested, Britain also saw the League of Nations as a forum for imperial governance. In 1919, the British Empire reached its greatest territorial extent. Britain, under the mandatory regime of the League of Nations, took charge of a host of mandated territories, notably Palestine, Iraq and Iran. So-called white dominions of Canada, New Zealand, Australia also became sovereign members of the League of Nations, as did Ireland and India, though the terms of its membership were more constrived. But this focus on Britain's conventional security did not address the desperate and pressing challenges faced by Central and Eastern Europe, identified by David Mitrani, and that Monet and Salter were also acutely aware of. Food was in short supply, disease, notably TB and influenza, were rife. Uh, transportation networks were in chaos and millions of people were displaced. The spectre of communist revolution, underway in the former Russian Empire since 1917, hung over a number of new republics in the region. This meant that the, that the Allies were forced inside the League to recreate the committees that they had established in the, in the war to try and manage the crisis in Central and Eastern Europe. And the unanticipated League intervention in health and economic crisis also informed the second strand of what became known as the Monet Method in the history of the European Union, and another feature that was very contentious in the 2016 referendum. As I've already outlined, the first strand of Monet's method was to partially integrate policy functions, in the first instance in 1951, coal and steel. The second strand of Monet's method was the expectation that further integration, deeper integration in the European Economic Community and the European Union would follow these economic and social issues, not just by positive choice, but by negative processes. In other words, crisis built capacity. And that's something that's happened inside the European Union since the credit crunch of 2008. The European Union has developed new political powers, new forces that are not necessarily legitimated and not necessarily properly understood. And that was part of the kind of internal mechanism that was there in the European economic community at different stages that allowed this organization to grow, which is also politically deeply contentious, not just inside Britain, but also on the European continent. In 1919, economic and financial questions had largely been excluded from the covenant of the League of Nations, but there was a series of crises in Hungary, in Austria, in Poland, that saw the League to build its capacity in these areas. And as part of this process, businessmen uh, and central bankers were a, a kind of core constituency in building that. So, what happens through this process is that the British government use, uses businessmen and financiers to help try and stabilise the European economy in one direction, and it's also conducting diplomacy inside the League to try and facilitate the conventional security needs of Britain. One of the things that it does, which is what's outlined here, is it stabilises the Austrian economy in 1920. And I've just listed there some of the economic measures that it takes, which actually establish the practices of international financial oversight. They are set up in 1920 that are still fundamental to the operations of the IMF and the European Central Bank today. And those are based on ideas that were predominantly drafted by the Bank of England. So when people talk about the coercive power of the European Union in financial terms. Actually, those core practices were developed by a group of people around Montague Norman, who was governor of the Bank of England at the time. Like the building blocks of the European economic community, 
The stabilization of Austria in 1920 was presented as a technical problem, a technical problem. It's complicated, it's technical. It was a way of depoliticizing a hugely difficult political issue. As part of the deal, Austria got the money, Austria's currency was stabilized, Austria agreed that it would no longer try and pursue Anschluss with Germany. There were two ways out of, well, two ways out of Austria's problems in 1920. Well, it's a different, completely different story. One was it would get international help, the other was it would merge with Germany. Austria got the international help from the League of Nations. The League of Nations developed a whole set of new capacities in financial, economic, and actually in health as a result of intervening in this enormous crisis. But the, the payoff was also that the border between Germany and Austria was fixed. And that has a direct echo, sort of in reverse, with the debates around the backstop, the, the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic currently that the British have forgotten about. They pioneered precisely that mechanism here. The problem underneath this is that the governments in the, in the, for the first time in the aftermath of the First World War are beginning to appreciate that they are responsible for managing the demands of their electorate and the demands of their electorate, which is much more democratic than it had been before the First World War, are focused on questions relating to jobs, to their employment prospects. Uh, and that's a new phenomenon. And it means, because the League is also, and the world in 1919 is about returning to free markets, means that international cooperation has to be about governance, not just the agency of government. And this is what Salter identified. What the League gives you is an unparalleled value of bringing together expert advice and representative advice. So those are the two things that the League has. It has, in, in the cr creation of a secretariat, it has expert advice, but it also has member states that are part of it. And that's precisely what the European Economic Community also seeks to be after 1945. In trade policy too, like the, sta the financial stabilisation, this is a further plank of Britain's efforts to bring order to Europe. And it drafts uh, this key clause in the League of Nations Covenant, which is pledged to secure and maintain equitable treatment of commerce. And moving questions of trade to the League was hugely significant for Britain and Europe. It multilateralized the practice of international trade negotiation and regulation. Before 1919, 1920, trade treaties were negotiated on a bilateral basis. After 1922, they are, get, they are negotiated multilaterally. And that's again what the European Economic Community attempts to do alongside the WTO or GATT after 1947. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, Britain's attempts to square free trade, which is what it says it's trying to do here, with, uh, in fairly vague terms, with its commitment to promote the security of empire, uh, is blown wide open. The British government finds itself confronted with continuous pressure actually building from the late 19th century from its imperial partners who are demanding protectionist links with the empire. And that's what the route that Britain goes down. But that providing imperial protection is also the route through which the Central and Eastern European powers use to try and demand trade protection, customs union of their own. So this is another sort of historic hangover in the debates around Britain's membership of the European Union, that in some ways the European economic community and the European Union is a recreation of German trade blocs that were around in the 1930s. But those trade blocs are justified at the time through... <laughs> Uh, by pointing at the British Empire, by saying, actually, the British have preferential deals with their empire, and we just want something similar. 
In the course of the 1930s, in contrast to the 1920s, Britain's attempts to resolve territorial disputes increasingly took place outside the League of Nations. It was a process accelerated by Germany, Japan and Italy's decisions to wage war on other League of Nations members. But Britain never broke faith with the League of Nations uh, or the prospects of institutionalised uh, cooperation. Britain helps facilitate part of the move of that organisation here to the United States, partly based here at the Institute. And Britain is, a, is the, one of the kind of key forces that promotes uh, international organisation through the United Nations, the IMF, the UN Food and Agriculture Organisation and the World Bank's kind of starburst of international global organisation after 1945. And another feature that's interesting about the Leave campaign is that Britain remains committed to those sorts of global international organisations. And this time in 1945, economic questions were not the bolt-on they had been in 1919. They were the priority. But the experience and outcome of the Second World War had important consequences for Britain's response to the numerous different proposals to organise Europe uh, in 1945. World War II forcefully shunted Britain and its empire onto a different track to the European mainland. There were four contributing factors. So this is the point at which Britain diverges from Europe in a way that it had been preoccupied with trying to stabilise Europe before 1939. So those four contributing factors. Firstly, Britain had never been invaded nor defeated. Never been invaded nor defeated. Its hard-won victory in the Second World War left a legitimate pride in a legal and constitutional system that had withstood the pressures unleashed by the Great Depression and the war in contrast to Germany and France and, and, and many other European countries whose political systems buckled in all sorts of ways in the 1930s. Secondly, Britain's dependence on the United States for its victory in, in the Second World War reinforced its 1919 view that the United States should equit, equate its security with the security of the world, much like Britain had in the past, in 1945, Britain's vision for the UN order was Atlanticist. That's also why NATO is so important. It's an Atlantic vision. Thirdly, in 1945, the move to institutionalised cooperation on a global level was stronger and more extensive than it had been in 1919. And in those global organisations, European states turned to Britain for leadership. Finally, and paradoxically, Empire II was more, not less, important after 1945. Why paradoxically? Well, firstly, because the United States said it fought the Second World War for democracy. And it made its opposition to the British Empire clear throughout the Second World War. It's there in the Atlantic Charter and so on. And especially when it came to the future of India. But the emerging Cold War fostered a new US tolerance to British imperialism. Britain's imperial territories had geostrategic importance. And rebranding helped. Mandates became trusteeships under the United Nations. And colonialism was now expressed through the language of development. So it wasn't tutelage. States were being, peoples were being developed. It was also paradoxical, and this surfaced very strongly in, in debates around the referendum in 2016, that although Britain fought to preserve the empire in 1913 alongside its imperial allies, the empire was terribly important to sustaining Britain's war effort, as was the United States, British memory of the Second World War is fashioned around the construction of Britain standing alone. There's a very sort of, you know, constant mantra really was, in, it will be all right, I'm still there, will be all right, we, we survived the Second World War, we can survive leaving the European Union. It's a kind of buoyant optimism. Uh, and there was also a characteristically British irony here, for by 1945, Britain had become deeply indebted, so indebted to the empire in economic and financial terms. So there wasn't a turn towards the empire because Britain wanted to embrace it. It had to embrace it because it owed it lots of money for the, for the material um, 
and, and, and paid for the armed forces that were coming from the empire during the course of the conflict. All countries, and India above all, held large amounts of sterling, so they actually had some say in what Britain could opt to do in 1945. And without going into more technical detail, their net effect was to reinforce Britain's dependence on empire. Victorious global Britain may have projected and sought to project strength in 1945. Projecting that strength was vital in its relationships with the United States because it wanted to feel like it could match the United States and look America in the eye. But the foundations of that strength forged in the 19th century had crumbled. So you can see that here on the, on the cartoon on your right with Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who starts to enter negotiations with uh, the European Economic Community in the 1960s about Britain potentially joining the European Union. And it's the empire, it's the dominions that have their tethers around his ankles. Although some British polit political leaders flirted with the notion of leading Europe after 1945, promoting European Union was an additional burden and complication in its relations with the United States and Europe. This contrasted with 1919, when the institutionalization of multilateral relations in the League was used as a means to stabilize Europe and facilitate continuing imperial ties. Now, it could go one way or the other. You couldn't do both. In the 1940s, with the US now taking an active role in the ways it hadn't in 1919, Britain, and this was the Americans' view too, was too often a hindrance and not a help. In 1948, Britain was an obstacle in American attempts to federalize European governments around the Marshall Plan, and Britain only grudgingly accepted the European Council Convention on Human Rights. And it was then, I mean, where the US role here is also decisive, the United States turned to France to lead Europe, and this was Monet's moment. And this is the point at which his plan for the joint Franco-West German control of coal and steel industries was born. The 1919 Franco-British drive for disarmament was reborn. In 1951, the focus wasn't on disarmament or conventional security, but on the raw materials of war, coal and steel. So guns and swords were turned into European plowshares. Over time, the success of the European Economic Community members set against Britain's moribund economic performance meant that Britain, conspicuously led by the Conservative Party, turned to Europe, but the move was couched in the language of decline. And perhaps revealingly um, about the period and the mentality, there's also this sense in which Britain's British power stops being muscular and starts to look weak and feminine. Uh, and that's what you can see a little bit here in the cartoon on the right-hand side, where you now see Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, Supermac, uh, in a bikini. And so his only bits of clothing are, are the bikini, which are really the protectionist ties that Britain has to, its, um, to the Commonwealth, faced with uh, President de Gaulle, who was never terribly keen on British membership, and then the other European economic community members lying naked, because they're actually the ones that are anti-protectionist, uh, and kind of also sort of liberated Europeans uh, on the beach. History served up from the vantage point of 1945 reveals Britain as naturally Eurosceptic, a, a reluctant partner who, paraphrasing the title of a well-known book on the history of Britain's accession, used Europe and abused Europeans. But I've tried to show how, and I hope I've conveyed some of it, that actually before 1945, Britain was also committed in different ways to European stability and to institutionalized cooperation in Europe. But let me just conclude by firing some parting shots on the still moving target of Brexit and Britain's relations, Britain's relations with Europe that uh, look back to 1919. I'm very conscious it's a moving target. It was still moving as I walked in today when I was waiting for the news. Um, so, one, the embedded history of Britain's relations with Europe and its ties to a rules-based international order reminds us that some of the ideas and practices of the European Customs Union derive from Britain's involvement in European affairs before 1945. That's partly why from the outside, what is happening in Britain seems so confusing because many of the rules, certainly all this stuff around most favoured nations clauses, unconditional most favoured nations clauses, that's based on British drafting 100 years ago. Two, 
That leading role explains why Britons, more than any other European partners, struggle with the notion of pool sovereignty and being a rule taker. Britain is used to drafting the rules. It's used to determining the rules of the game. Um, that's part of the challenge. Three, throughout the process of seeking to leave, Britain has continued to look to international law to make its case. And that's a more positive note, I think, even if some of the international law that we're turning to to try and get around the backstop problem is obscure, to say the least. And finally, four, the project of leaving the European Union is defined as much by what has been forgotten as remembered, notably the tragic history of the 1930s. Looking to history also shows us what is new. What is most striking of all, at least at the moment, is that the overtones of cool-headed British pragmatism that Britain has long sought to cultivate in its diplomacy, those qualities associated with Jeeves or Harold Macmillan are nowhere to be seen. The view of the rest of the world is that Bertie Wooster is in charge now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful and very elegant lecture and I'm sure um, we have learned a lot about historical hangovers now and there um, will be many questions um, and Patricia can also explain the Irish backstop. So um, she, she's Irish herself so I think mm -hmm. if you have technical questions, any kind of questions, if there's a Brexiteer here that would be interesting too. Yeah. So um, yes please. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the tension between empire versus Europe. And with the, uh, right now with the Commonwealth, is there a feeling that that, that would be the primary source for trade if, Europe, if uh, Britain were to leave the, when it leaves the European Union, that there'll be a special place in the hearts of the Commonwealth countries to start new trade? I think so. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about it uh, is the way that when Britain entered the economic community, there, it, wasn't, it was sort of recognised that some of those pre preferential deals would go. But at that point, it was also that uh, countries like Australia and, I mean, Australia is an interesting one, sort of wanted free because they didn't just want to be seen as a raw material or a food producer for Britain. They also wanted some of the benefits of a more industrialised manufacturing economy. And I think that's also partly what this move and the, and the kind of Lee campaign reflects is that actually Australia is one of the most dynamic economies around. It's located strongly in Asia alongside the former, you know, I mean Singapore also has its point in, in British imagination. One of the challenges is that Trade deals take a hell of a long time to negotiate, um, and we Britain needs to negotiate, I think, 59 of them to replace what the European Economic Community or the EU has. It's negotiated four currently. Um, but it's certainly true that in the EU referendum, in the 2016 referendum, people from the uh, Commonwealth who are resident in the United Kingdom were entitled to vote. And for them, part of that was a sense of the loss of their privileges over the entitlement that Europeans had. And it's also the case that there, that, you know, that is, I mean, we all hope there will be deals and that is some of the places that um, I hope Britain will secure some. But the difficulty has been, it's, it's clear in the case of India, Britain hasn't really sought to maintain those ties very effectively. And actually also from inside the British government, nobody has any experience of doing this anymore. You know, that's one of the things that in the last 40 years, that was something that the capacity went to the European Union. So the British government is now, re or in a way, in effect, recreating the board of trade. Um, and those of us that know about the history of trade negotiations are writing kind of, this is what it looks like to negotiate a trade deal. So it's sort of, it's, it's the, it's the, that's what I mean about the magnitude of it. And that's sort of something that only really sank in. And for me as a historian, um, was quite shocking because I think of these great offices of the Foreign Office and the Board of Trade. I still imagine they're there, you know, but the Foreign Office is now divided into different sections and one big section, one big part of its energy is just trying to negotiate Britain's way out of these agreements. 
So uh, I'm hoping that the, the, the good feeling around the Commonwealth and the fact that some of the more dynamic economies in the world are there um, will help Britain in the future. But one of the challenges is that the history is, is complicated um, and we haven't really put much energy into those ties in the last 40 years or so. So it's kind of fingers crossed. Yes, Ken, uh, thanks for the uh, insight. Uh, what's your uh, view of the Irish border? And what is the potential impact on the Easter Agreement? On the, can you say the last bit again? What's the potential impact on the? On, on the, uh, on the uh, treaty to end the uh, troubles in Northern yeah, Ireland. Yeah, 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 the Anglo-Irish Agreement. I mean, in, uh, I'm trying to be optimistic about that because I think what we see is a lot of, uh, there has been quite a lot of goodwill around trying to make that work, actually. The difficulty is the way that it's, the problem is set up in international law because as it stands, uh, it's the kind of the reverse of the Austrian problem. The way that uh, the, the issue over not of, of securing peace between and ending the Republic's claims to union with Northern Ireland was essentially to create a single economic space and to remove the border in economic terms and, and so, to a certain extent in financial terms and in VAT terms. Uh, and so... And that, that responsibility for that deal went up into the European Union, as well as between, you know, a deal signed between Britain and Ireland. The difficulty is that when Theresa May went to Europe and said her red lines were no customs union, no single market, that necessarily means, in the terms of the Anglo-Irish agreement, a hard border. Uh, and so the various attempts to try and get round that, either by having sort of electronic systems that nobody's tried, so it, the border is there technically, but in practical terms it's not there, that's not been tested. And that was partly where, you know, there was a quite a lot of, you know, finger pointing, the British need to come up with this, it's their problem, uh, and, and Britain looking to the European Union to try and look for an imaginative solution. So one of those solutions was to then say, OK, let's keep Northern Ireland inside the customs union and the single market for some time and have the hard border essentially running down the middle of the Irish Sea. But of course, that became a problem for the Democratic Unionist Party because it treats Northern Ireland differently to the rest of the United Kingdom. So that's why, it, especially after the, 19, uh, the 2017 electoral outcome, that became so problematic because Theresa May is dependent on that group of people to get the deal through. And th so this is sort of, and they seem to be pretty, uh, well, yeah, determined not to back the deal over this issue. And there doesn't seem to be any way around it because in fact it's a peace project that's enshrined through a trade agreement. Um, the, the, on the more positive side, if it's, if it's positive, I mean, I'm a citizen of the Republic, but I've spent almost my whole life and been educated in Britain. And um, so there's many of us like this, you know, we're all kind of jumbled up on the inside. Um, and for me, it was an enormous relief, actually, to just have one passport that meant I could you know, <laughs> I wasn't having difficulties. I was explaining Corinna some of this background. Actually, there hasn't been, there, well, there have been a few attempts to kind of poke at the peace agreement, but actually, if anything, the, the people in Northern Ireland are now more conscious of their relationships with the South than they were because, I mean, people in Britain are now spectacularly well informed on WTO rules, European Union rules, things of customs union, single markets, all this technical stuff people never knew about, didn't care about, were bored to death when they listened to people like me talking about it. Now suddenly people are quite well informed and so actually in practical terms the citizens of the North, including some younger Protestant people have acquired and are entitled to acquire Irish passports, they now have. So there are ways that the peace seems to be holding, which for me in some respects is the most important thing. And everybody is trying to find a way through this um, the tragedy will be if it produces a no deal. For me, I think that that's really will be very unwelcome 
um, for all of the other consequences that will follow. Sorry, it was a long answer. Complicated problem. Uh, this follows up on the Northern Ireland, but as I understand, there was, at least in the past, such a thing as the common travel area, and that was before they together entered the EU. Um, could you explain why that is no longer like a viable thing in terms it, of the Good Friday Agreement? Just yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can try. I mean, I think it, it, it isn't, it's, that's fine actually. So the common travel area means that you don't need a passport to go from between the Republic and, and, and the British Isles. Um, and um, between north and south. The, the problem is that the... So you could still move around as a person if you're Irish, but not necessarily anybody else. Well, British and Irish, but not anybody else. Uh, and it also doesn't get round the, the fact that the two economies of Northern Ireland and the south have become heavily integrated and that that border will become, in law, a hard border. And so either it means that either um, the, the current British option is to have no tariffs and say, don't worry, we're not really going to check anything. European Union, it's OK. But the European Union will say, well, we need to check stuff because there's, there's possibility for all sorts of things that will endanger the single market and the European peace project that the European Union is. So the single, the common travel area doesn't affect, in the same way my rights as an Irish citizen um, are but resident for a long time, long time in the United Kingdom are not affected, but actually it's not in, it hasn't been tested in law. It's not entirely clear that some of those older Anglo-Irish agreements to do with people like me who were born to, uh, uh, my father is Irish, um, I was born outside the United Kingdom, so I'm Irish, but my brothers are British because they were born inside the United Kingdom. Just to kind of get round those problems, whether those deals are, um, can trump European Union law or not. So I, because I knew when I was giving this lecture, I thought we might be exiting, we should be exiting on Friday. I thought I'll be fine, I'll be going back in with my Irish passport, but my husband absolutely insisted I get my right to remain because he wasn't convinced, he's a lawyer, he wasn't convinced I would find it that easy to come straight. I needed a you know, proof of residency, which is, in, in legal terms, I don't think I need. But the problem is everybody's not quite sure what they need and don't need. Thank you for your uh, fascinating lecture. This is sort of a, like a monetary question. So if you look at fiat currency back in 1919 and through the years, you've had obviously a gold standard that's gone away. You've gone from uh, everyone in the empire having the same currency where they've now created their own currency that aren't necessarily linked to the, to the sterling. Obviously in Europe, there's one currency with few exceptions, Switzerland and Sweden and Norway. So in the minds of the voters, do they feel that they're not as valued, like the value of the pound, the value of the status, the monetary value perception is less and by supporting to leave, it can help create the perception of being more valued from a perception of, a, a, this is just as a person yeah, on the street. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a very good question. I certainly think that, uh, the, you know, the British, uh, the, the European side uh, is kind of interesting on this. The British saw, and that was certainly there in the Eurozone campaign, the Eurozone was conflated with the whole of the European Union, and it was presented as the European Union has become a coercive project. Look at what they're doing to the Greeks. Look at what they're doing to Spain. Look at what they're doing to Portugal. Uh, so that was part of it. It's a failing monetary system, and that certainly people like Nigel Lawson um, uh, would talk about that because they knew about the gold standard and how that had failed. So I don't think they thought voting leave would mean that sterling would gain in value, and of course it hasn't. It's depreciated significantly, which is also one of the reasons I think the economy's held up really well, thank goodness. Um, but I think they did think uh, this is a failing project. You know, this is, this is a thing that's in trouble. Um, let's get out. 
of course, the city of London, if the Eurozone goes down, the city of London goes <laughs> But of course, people who are voting leave don't care about the city of London. It's one of the things that's very interesting about Theresa May's deal. It's, everyone's fixated on tariff levels, which is... Um, and, and kind of nominal tariffs, they're not thinking about a whole set of other things that will be seriously affected, and one of them is the City of London. But nobody cares about the City of London. Nobody wants to make an argument about the fact 25% of British GDP is generated by the City because it's just an unpopular case. And even, you know, even the Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, doesn't say very much about it. Um, so I th it is, it is it's certainly underneath this for some of the people who sound very authoritative, but then they also use financial, they use this kind of financial crisis as a way of saying, well, nobody saw the 2008 crisis coming, and it's horrendous, and so all these people who are saying that it'll be terrible when Britain leaves the European Union, they don't know what they're talking about because forecasting, can't forecast anything, but that's, you know, somebody has said it's a bit like making a difference, pointing out a difference between climate and weather. Um, I just had a question. Uh, in case there are any other countries watching uh, who are thinking about leaving the European Union, is there any advice you would give to them? Things they should do differently? <laughs> have to do it. Yeah, have a plan. <laughs> I think. <laughs> you know, that's the thing that's really shocking. But I think that I say that because I'm a historian who studied planning and who studied planning in war, you know. So you see how much, when I was here 10 years ago, I sat in the, you know, the wonderful archives that they have here and I looked at all the people that came to the Institute that were in all the energy that was going into planning what will the world be like after 1945, all the different catastrophes that it will face and the directors of this place making very strong cases for the importance of expertise to deal with complicated problems and you know the, the 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 i mean and i thought there must be a plan i didn't understand what the plan was going to be i have to say um, because i'm because i do think about trade law and trade deals but it's also an expertise that's terribly unfashionable um, and pretty rare the british government is hoovering these people up i've you know i because it's you know, it wasn't sort of the connection between foreign policy and, uh, and trade policy, you know, sort of disappeared as an academic subject for the last 20 or so years. And if you, if you open books on multilateralism, they say, well, nobody, nobody would now seriously challenge a multilateral international order. You know, not, not, no. So, but I think have a plan, really think it through, know, know the consequences of, if you, if you have red lines, all the way down the line. I mean, I think I was saying to Corinna, one of the things that was, was um, very shocking the day after the referendum was visiting a friend whose two daughters were uh, 18 and 20, absolutely distraught. And they, they were distraught because their father's from the US, their mother was from France, they've spent their whole life in the United Kingdom, they're British, but their parents, as a connection to their own countries, ensured they had a British passport and a French passport and they now suddenly were no longer automatically entitled to be, or they were now having to think, how do they become entitled to stay in this country? And as a young person, you don't have any rights. I mean, this is what I discovered when I was 19 and I tried to get a British passport. My parents needed to sort it out, they hadn't, and I then was sort of stuck until I had worked and, and so on. So there, you know, there's a kind of, there's a lot of young people who are children of European Union citizens who now don't feel wanted. Many of them are my students. Um, and I think that that's just deeply upsetting because I remember that feeling myself. Yeah. So, but yeah, lesson one, plan, plan, plan. <laughs> one last selfish question for me. Um, should there be a second referendum? <sighs> it's a very difficult question, actually, because I want, I want to say yes, because you know, the leave and the remain things were so abstract and most of those claims were not tested. Nobody's responsible for them because the political parties didn't stand behind either camp. They were on both sides. Labour was supposed to be remain but didn't campaign for remain. Um, and, uh, and of course, at that time, nobody seriously thought there would be a no deal. 
and everybody thought actually Britain would be able to negotiate, you know, Boris Johnson's famous phrase about we'll be able to have our cake and eat it, you know, cakeism is a kind of thing. Uh, and so we would, Britain would have this, because Britain in the past had always done quite well out of international negotiations. John Major did very well in the negotiations for the 1992 Maastricht Treaty. So part of me wants to, the people to have a choice, because this is supposed to be about democracy, to choose. But I have to say, because I feel like I've been living in a washing machine for the last three, you know, you go round and round and round, it speeds up, spins down, then you're sort of sitting in some water at the bottom of the machine, and then it goes again. Um, that's what it's been like. It's fa it's, and I think, you know, most people are extremely stressed about it. What research shows is actually this has become a profoundly emotional, emotional issue. And people have not really moved very much. Uh, one fifth of all couples who are seeking marriage guidance counselling are going because they have different views on this issue. <laughs> so, you know, I saw, I, you know, I was kind of like, let's, now we know what we, now what's, now we know what the deal is, now we know, but people cannot agree what should be on the ballot paper. I know, based on the research around that particular referendum, the way that was positioned, that in itself was problematic. Everybody seems to be so divided, so committed, I sort of am now, it's a very British answer, you can see in a way I'm, well, it's also would be an Irish answer, you just sort of want to fudge. You just want to fudge in a kind of holding pattern above Heathrow <laughs> until, you know. So I, I, I kind of think, I think not. I think if we can come to that without going back to the, just because you can see in the debates just at the moment in the House of Commons, everybody's got different ideas as to what this should be. Everybody is now, now thinks that they can put into the pot what they think Britain's ideal relationship with the European Union should be. I think one of the things that's become clear to me is that somewhere along the way, that sort of famous British confidence in international negotiation, you know, this is a negotiation with the European Union as well as a negotiation with one another. So I, I'm sort of become much more wary of the referendum. I'm, it pains me to say it, but I have. Mm. I guess we have to um, end this now, but um, the lecture series will continue and perhaps we will have Patricia back because she gave us such a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.